All right, welcome back. Now, in this series of videos, we're going to talk about the second half of clinical reasoning. That's the making and testing of hypotheses. This first one, we're going to talk about the differential diagnosis. And you can see here we have the two steps here. We had our data gathered, which we talked about in the previous videos. And here we're going to talk about hypotheses testing, which comes into two pieces, the making of a differential diagnosis. And you can see here there's a bunch of components to it. We'll talk about those. And then in the next video, we're going to talk about testing your differential diagnosis. We're going to revisit illness scripts a little bit. We're going to talk about thresholds testing. So what is a differential diagnosis? It's, it's one of the crucial aspects of clinical reasoning. If you have a patient who comes in with a chief complaint such as, my belly hurts, the differential diagnosis is all the possible causes that for my belly hurting. And so you need to be able to think of what could be causing it. If you can't think of it, you can't find it. If you don't look for it, you won't find it. So you need to have a good list of a differential diagnosis. So how do you build it? That's what's important. And so when you make a differential diagnosis, you're going to use one of uh, several different methods here. And I wrote them down here. Pattern recognition. You could pick the things that are most probable. Uh, let's go through each one of these uh, in turn. So pattern recognition means that you've seen something like this in the past. You've seen this before. And so if you see somebody who comes in clutching their chest, they look all sweaty, and you've seen 17 patients this week that looked exactly like that, that had a heart attack, you know what? They're probably having a heart attack. And so this is built with experience. Okay, most probable. These are the things that the most common cause for this. So if someone comes in with uh, fever, cough, uh, runny nose, uh, you know, and most likely it's a cold. It doesn't have to be, but most likely it is. So those, this is another way to make a differential diagnosis. Another thing is the must not, must not miss. And this is what we use in the emergency department where I work. These are the diagnoses that if you miss them, the patient can die or lose some sort of function, uh, like lose an arm or lose the ability to, uh, to, to walk properly or use their hands, whatever. So this one is we use especially in the emergency department. You should also consider these things. What are the things that if I miss it, it's dangerous? Then there's other methods that are more systematic, like the anatomical or physiologic method. So the anatomical method says if someone comes in with chest pain, you say, what organs are in the chest that could cause the pain? Well, there's lungs in there, there's a heart in there, there's the esophagus, there's the uh, bones of the chest, so there's muscles of the chest, so you can use that method. Now, the physiologic uh, method says, what are the, you know, how does the body work, and how can I explain what's going on? So if someone has anemia, you can say, well, what are the different ways that someone can be anemic? Well, they could be uh, not making blood, they could be losing blood, or they could be destroying blood. Now, what are the different ways that those things can happen? So that's a nice physiologic mechanism. And then the last one here is mnemonics. And this one, I think, it's probably used fairly often, though maybe not the best way. And that's used memory devices, such as here we have one called Vindicate, which stands for make sure you look for things that are vascular, infectious, neurologic, degenerative, intoxication, uh, congenital type things, autoimmune, trauma, and endocrine. It spells Vindicate. All right. And so you're going to look for all of infra, all the you, you're going to be able to make your differential diagnosis many times throughout the, your patient interaction when you first get a chief complaint you should start making your differential diagnosis so when somebody comes to the emergency department complaining of chest pain i'm already thinking of five or ten different things that it could be and it's mostly coming from this category here i've not met the patient yet and i'm already starting to think about things then when you start asking questions you may get more information that makes you think of other things when you start doing your physical and when you start doing the testing, your differential may change as well. So throughout this process of evaluating a patient, you are going to be making new differential diagnoses. Uh, you're going to be changing it and adding to it as well. All right. So I'm going to break this down really into two components. And this is the way that some people believe clinical reasoning works, that there are two systems to clinical reasoning. System one is called uh, the more intuitive, heuristic way, uh, method. It's the one that, you know, it's your gut that it comes from. System two is the more deliberative, slower, uh, you got to put a lot of thought into it. So people always call this lazy system one and uh, because, because it's, it doesn't like to put a lot of effort into it. And system two, you got to put a lot of effort into it. I like to think of it differently. I like to think of it as Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock. Captain Kirk, he shoots from the hip. He goes with his gut. You know, and he's and he doesn't overthink things. And you know what? He's right a lot of times. Why? Because he's seen a lot of things and he's done a lot of things. He has experience. Mr. Spock, on the other hand, he's more deliberative. He talks. He thinks. 
And he tries to figure out what are the logical explanations for things, and so he uses this sort of uh, these sort of things. Now, you, as a medical student, early in your career, are not going to have a lot of experience. You're not going to have a lot of patience under your belt. So you're going to be more Spock than you are Kirk. But with time, you're going to find that you'll be more like Kirk. All right, so let's go through an example. Let's make a differential diagnosis now, all right? And uh, we're going to start with a guy who comes in with what we call altered mental status. That is, they're confused. All right, so let's go through this process. So pattern recognition. I work in the emergency department. Let's say it's, it's the night of a music fest, and I've had 17 patients come in all drunk, and the three people who came in with this guy were also, was also drunk, so he looks like he's drunk, and he smells of alcohol. Right, so that's my pattern recognition one. Most probable, maybe I also, you know, most often when people come in confused, it's due to uh, th their blood sugar is low because they've not been eating. So low blood sugar can be something. Must not miss things could be maybe he bumped his head and he's bleeding in his brain. So that could kill him if I miss that. Or a brain infection could also kill him. So I can't miss those things. So I need to consider those as well. Anatomical. Well, what makes someone confused? What's inside the head? Well, there's obviously brain. There's the blood vessels that feed the brain. There's the skull. So maybe any problems with any of those things. Physiologic. What causes confusion? Well, it's when the brain is not getting enough fuel. So why would that happen? Well, maybe blood's not flowing to the brain for some reason. Maybe the blood, sugar, but blood is flowing to the brain, but there's no sugar in it. Or maybe there's no oxygen in it. These are two fuels that you need. Maybe toxins are poisoning the brain and affecting the way it can use the fuels. So this is a more physiologic method. Now what about a mnemonic? There's a mnemonic we will use. A-E-I-O-U, tips. Things like alcohol, acidosis, epilepsy, electrolytes, infection, overdose, oxygen deficit, uremia. So you can see all of these things that spell out A-E-I-O-U, tips, and to remind you to think about these things. So now when you go and gather data, you need to gather data that looks at each one of these things. And so, when you present a patient, uh, and this is what, what when I say present, that means at some point you're going to collect information and think about it. You're going to have to tell your, tell your resident or tell an attending or another doctor what's going on. Uh, you're going to present to your patient. And at the end, you're going to summarize what you know. And so one thing that you always want to do is you're going to start with the most likely diagnosis that you think is going on, not the most probable thing. This is the thing, in this particular patient, I think it's most likely that he's drunk because he came in with a bunch of drunk people. He's got some vodka in his pocket, and he smells like alcohol. And then you should also report some common diagnosis. Well, it could also be that his blood sugar is low. And you and you can't miss diagnoses. And but it's also and it's also possible that he hit his head because he could have fallen off that car he was standing on top of while he was partying. And uh, and then you would provide your supporting evidence for these things. And so this is this is going to be a, a future skill. But I just want to let you know that that's going to happen here. All right. Thanks a lot.